of Our Lady of Victory in Delhi. Thank you for listening to Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. 740 WNOP Newport, 910 WPFB Middletown, or get the app, stream, podcast, and more at sacredheartradio.com. Today is Thursday, April the 4th, Thursday in the octave of Easter and the feast of St. Isidore of Seville. So let's begin this hour praying a prayer he wrote to the Holy Spirit for guidance. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. O Holy Spirit, we are here before you conscious of our many sins, but united in a special way in your holy name. Come and abide with us and deign to penetrate our hearts. Be the guide of our actions, indicate the path we should follow, and show us what we must do, so that with your help, our work may be wholly pleasing to you. May you be our only inspiration and the overseer of our intentions, for you alone possess a glorious name with the Father and the Son. May you, who are infinite justice, never permit us to be disturbers of justice. Let us let not our ignorance induce us to evil, nor flattery sway us, nor moral and material interest corrupt us. Thus united in your name, may we in our every action follow the dictates of your mercy and justice. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning and welcome to this Thursday edition of the Sunrise Morning Show here on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. I'm Anna Mitchell coming to you from the studios of Sacred Heart Catholic Radio in Cincinnati, Ohio. Matt Swaim is on vacation on spring break this week. Paul Lockman at the controls for us and Travis Smith has our video feed up and running so you can watch the Sunrise Morning Show Find a link to YouTube and Facebook Live through our website in the show notes at sonrisemorningshow.com. Up this hour, Father Robert Nixon continues our series going through St. Albert the Great's reflections on the virtues in the book he translated, The Paradise of the Soul. Today, we're talking about the virtue of faith. Dr. Matthew Bunsen will discuss today's saint saint isidore of seville who is a doctor of the church don butner will be along and she's going to be talking about a book that she didn't write it's called too small a world and it's on the life of mother francis xavier cabrini and so we will talk about that with don and then we will wrap things up for the hour with our catholic counselor kevin prendergast about april as alcohol awareness month Hope you can stick around for the entire hour ahead. Right now it's three minutes past and it's time for news. President Biden will hold a call with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today. The expected call between the two leaders comes after seven World Central Kitchen aid workers were killed in an Israeli attack in Gaza. Biden said he was outraged by the incident and urged Israel to do more to protect civilians in Gaza as Israeli forces wage war on Hamas. During his general audience yesterday, Pope Francis appealed again for peace in the Holy Land. From Vatican Radio, Devin Watkins reports. Reflecting on the war in the Holy Land, the Pope lamented the tragic news that continues to come from the Middle East. I reiterate, said the Holy Father, my firm request for an immediate ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. The Holy Father expressed his deep regret for the staff members killed as they distributed humanitarian aid in Gaza and reassured his prayers for them and their families. On Tuesday, Israeli airstrikes killed seven aid workers in Gaza who were delivering food with the U.S.-based charity World Central Kitchen. Those killed included three British nationals, an Australian, a Polish national, an American-Canadian dual citizen, and a Palestinian. I renew, said the Pope, my appeal for the exhausted and suffering civilian population to be allowed access to humanitarian aid and for the hostages to be released immediately. 
Let us avoid any irresponsible attempts to escalate the conflict in the region, he added, calling for tireless efforts to put an end to this and other wars that continue to bring death and suffering to so many parts of the world. I'm Devin Watkins. Pope Francis focused on the virtue of justice in his general audience catechesis yesterday as he continued his series on virtues and vices. Vatican News reports the Holy Father pointed out that this is not just an individual virtue, but a social one. He said, justice is fundamental for peaceful coexistence. He said, where justice is not respected, conflicts arise. Without justice, he said, the law of the prevalence of the strong over the weak is entrenched. Another Alabama hospital plans on stopping all in vitro fertilization by the end of this year. Yesterday, Mobile Infirmary said it will no longer be able to offer IVF services due to litigation concerns surrounding the procedure. The decision follows Alabama's Supreme Court ruling that anyone who destroys frozen human embryos can be held liable for wrongful death, and IVF regularly involves the destruction of human embryos. After the court's decision in February, three hospitals stopped offering IVF the following week. The judge in Donald Trump's hush money case is rejecting his presidential immunity argument. Brian Shook reports. Trump is being charged with falsifying business records and has repeatedly tried to get New York Judge Juan Mershon recused from the case. On Wednesday, Mershon shot down Trump's bid to use presidential immunity as part of his defense. The judge also denied Trump's motion to delay the trial's start date. I'm Brian Shook. And the Federal Aviation Administration is investigating after two people were injured when a Southwest Airlines flight was forced to make an emergency landing due to severe turbulence on Wednesday. The flight was headed from New Orleans to Orlando when it was diverted to Tampa, with the captain requesting paramedics be on standby for its arrival. A passenger and a flight attendant were transported to an area medical facility after the plane landed. I have to say, I usually think it's fun when there's turbulence, but that Paul just gave me the strangest look <laughs> but I have to say I I don't know it's just like makes things more exciting but eh, if I got injured and eh, yeah maybe turbulence isn't quite as fun as I'd like to make it out to be anyway today is Thursday April the 4th the feast of Saint Isidore of Seville. More on him with Dr. Matthew Bunsen in just a little bit. St. Isidore, pray for us. Doctor of the Church. Well, we got another Doctor of the Church to talk about right now. Father Robert Nixon joining us again on the Sunrise Morning Show. He's a Benedictine monk at New Norcia in Australia, translator of the Tan Resurrection series, and we have been going through St. Albert the Great's The Paradise of the Soul. Father, welcome back. Christ is risen. Thank you, Eddie. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. And we are going to be talking about St. Albert's reflections on the virtue of faith today. And it's kind of like some catechesis within the catechesis, I guess you could say. How does he define faith? Indeed, he he includes this uh, wonderful catech talks. He says, about faith he says faith is firmly to believe in the father the son and the holy spirit and to believe that these are one and only god and to believe that in these three persons is a single undivided deity equal in glory and co-eternal in majesty and then he goes on to uh, talk about the theology of the trinity uh, for a little bit and and I think the reason he does this is, um, well, for a number of reasons, because he is a great theologian, and uh, part of his role was to instruct the young Dom- Dominicans in in the basis of theology. And of course, the, the, the Trinity, the understanding of this mystery, is something which can never be reiterated a lot uh, mm. a- enough. It is, um, it is something which is 
at the very beginning of our faith, but also at the very end of the faith, this mystery which uh, never exhausts itself. So he revisits the doctrine of the Trinity, the belief in this one and only God um, who is uncreated, infinite, eternal, perfectly good and wise and omnipotent. And nevertheless, the uh, this unconfused uh, personhood of the members of the Trinity. Yeah, and I, I'm imagining that he did this on purpose because, I mean, I don't, I mean, for you as a priest that, that you know, studies this stuff for a living, um, the doctrine of the Trinity might be a little better to, easier to grasp, easier? Probably not the right word. But for me, the doctrine of the Trinity seems harder to understand the more I try to understand it, right? The more I try to read or yeah. study or, or kind of like know, talk about I, it. I, yeah, I, and Annie, I think that is, that's one of the, the wonderful things. The more a person uh, immerses themselves in this mystery, in this doctrine, which is also a mystery, um, the the more mysterious and profound it becomes. Mm. And this was one of the great things which St. Augustine, another uh, brilliant doctor of the church, suggested in his book on the Trinity, that that our immersion into this mystery is, is enough for an entire spiritual life. So we shouldn't be at all surprised if the more we contemplate uh, this doctrine, the more mysterious it becomes. Because the more we contemplate God, the more we contemplate love, mm. the more we contemplate the resurrection and death of Christ um, and his union of humanity and divinity. We never actually sort out these things and say, oh, well, I've got it now. I, I understand it all. <laughs> In fact, we immerse ourselves ever more deeply into the mystery. And I think this is the key to the virtue of faith this willingness to, to immerse ourselves, to sit with the mystery and to accept it in all of its obscurity, but also all of its great splendor. Yeah, absolutely. That was that was where I was trying to go with this, actually, because I was thinking about it. You know, some might read what, what St. Albert had to say. He has this incredible paragraph um, explaining the Trinity and then um, about Jesus Christ being both truly God and truly human. And, and, and these things are so hard to grasp. And, and like you said, you, you yeah. need to sit with the mystery, but there are some who might just read these explanations and say, this is impossible and just give up. Yes. But we have to have the mind In, of indeed. faith here. Yes. And, you know, the uh, one of the things of a great theologian, and this is certainly the case with uh, Albert the Great, is this willingness to sit there in awe and wonder at these things. And not, OK, this is sorted out, or uh, if I can't sort it out, then it makes no sense. And, you know, that is, um, is a position which reflects a, a failure of humility. Because we can only approach these things with humility, mm. with the um, with the fact that we don't understand, yet we still believe. And this not fully understanding, but still believing, is the essence of the merit of faith. Yeah. Who are the examples he upholds as models of faith? So he gives us some examples taken from the Old Testament. He talks about Job. And Job is someone who he classifies as being one of those who were pagan by birth because we're told in the scriptures he lived in the land of Uz. Mm. And um, no one knows exactly where that is. But the fact is he still fully committed himself to God. And also Rahab, the prostitute, who, of course, uh, rescued the Israelites when they were needy. see this amongst uh, Moses and the other patriarchs who were prepared to step out into the unknown, uh, to embrace God fully. And, of course, we have the benefit of the resurrected Christ. We have the church and so forth. Yet there is still uh, an element of, of accepting, of stepping into the unknown for, for every single believer. Yeah. I found it so interesting what he had to say about the signs of genuine and counterfeit faith. Can you talk about that? Yes, so one of the key signs of genuine faith is that it manifests itself in actions. 
And of course, this is something which is expressed very clearly in the epistle of the Apostle James, um, that faith without good works is dead. And um, a genuine faith will always express itself in particular actions uh, in the same way that a genuine devotion or genuine love will always manifest itself in actions. If it remains without actions, then the faith is, is hollow, that it's words or even thoughts only. Mm. Um, and he talks about then signs of the key signs which he gives is when there's a discrepancy between a person's behavior in private and their behavior in public. And that if they in public behave according to the precepts of religion and, and devotion and so forth, but in private they cast that off, then uh, Albert rightly discerns that that is a sign of a faith which is not terribly strong or profound, that, um, you know, that, they, that it, it will not show itself in private in the same way as in public. Because if our faith is strong, whatever we do will be the same in private and in public. Absolutely. So, Father, could you close us with a bit of St. Albert's prayer for faith? Indeed, any. He prays, Lord God, you are mysterious and ineffable in your nature and transcend all human comprehension. Therefore, you may be known and loved, not by rational understanding, but by faith alone. It is such faith which bestows power and efficacy to prayer. For you, O Lord, have assured us that with any supplication or petition uttered with perfect faith, you will always be heard and answered. Fill my heart with the virtue and grace of faith dispelling from me all presumptuous doubt and helping me to believe even when I cannot understand. And let my faith be made living and true by the solid testimony of good works. Amen. Amen. We've been talking to Father Robert Nixon. You can find The Paradise of the Soul linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Father, thank you so much. Thank you, Annie. God bless you, and God bless all your listeners on this day. Thank you so much, Father, you as well. All right, at 17 past, we're back with headlines right after this here on the Sunrise Morning Show. Central Fabricators is proud to support the Sunrise Morning Show, where you'll get news from the Catholic perspective while keeping you up to date on what's happening in the Vatican as well. It's also a great way to keep in touch with the Catholic faith throughout the week. Central Fabricators, based in Cincinnati, Ohio, is a family-owned business for over 75 years, manufacturing and repairing corrosion-resistant storage tanks, reactors, and pressure vessels. On the web at centralfabricators.com. That's centralfabricators.com. For more than 150 years, the Comboni missionaries have traveled to nearly every corner of the world. Founded by St. Daniel Comboni, we are an international Catholic organization dedicated to ministering the world's poorest and most abandoned people. Your donations make a huge impact, and 95% are used to fund our many projects. Find out more at ComboniMissionaries.org. That is ComboniMissionaries.org. Have you subscribed to get the Sunrise Morning Show show notes? When you subscribe, the show notes arrive in your inbox weekday mornings with the list of featured guests, books, articles, and websites we'll discuss. And then you'll also get the podcast with markers to quickly find and hear an interview again or to see the Sunrise Morning Show on video. So to know when your favorite guests are on, go to sunrisemorningshow.com and click subscribe. Each weekday, we'll dive into the timeless teachings of our Catholic faith, drawing upon the wisdom of the ages to navigate the challenges of today. Together, we'll seek truth, find inspiration, and forge a deeper connection with God. I'm Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and I invite you to join me for Beacon of Truth, today at 4 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Team pass now on the Sunrise Morning Show. Let's take a look at headlines. President Biden will hold a call with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today, this coming after seven aid workers were killed in an Israeli attack in Gaza. 
During his general audience yesterday, Pope Francis appealed again for peace in the Holy Land and in his catechesis, continued his series on virtues and vices, focusing this week on the virtue of justice. Next newscast in about 10-ish minutes from now at the bottom of the hour here on the Sunrise Morning Show. So uh, today and yesterday at Mass, uh, all this week, we're reading in the Gospel accounts of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. And uh, I was reading a sermon by St. Augustine yesterday on the road to Emmaus, which is what we heard yesterday, and and we kind of hear the... the uh, postlude to that story uh, today at Mass. And uh, St. Augustine was reflecting on how they saw him in the breaking of the bread. That's when they recognized him. And he said, so the Lord made himself present in the breaking of the bread. Learn where to look for the Lord. Learn where to have him. Learn where to recognize him. It's when you eat him. Sermon 235 by St. Augustine, if you want to go read the whole thing. It's it's pretty good. Pretty good. St. Augustine, pray for us. It's 21 past. I'm Father Rob Jack. Join me this afternoon for Driving Home to Faith when Margie Christie will share the Sidewalk for Life campaign in Dayton. Dr. Jennifer Robat morris will discuss the Ruth Institute's Adult Appreciation Week. I'll reflect on St. Mark's story of Jesus' resurrection, the frequent traffic and weather to get you home safely. That's this afternoon beginning at 4 on Sacred Heart Radio. You're on the road to Christ the King. Support for Sacred Art Radio is from Rua Wood Psychological Services, integrating psychological science and the truths of our Catholic faith with offices in Dayton and Cincinnati. More information at 513-407-8878 or rwpsych.org. The highest standards, integrity, and best practices are core values at Rainbow International of Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky, your partners in residential and commercial insurance repair and restoration. Rainbow International, proud to support Sacred Heart Radio. 513-271-1000. Wimberg Landscaping, a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio, has been beautifying properties for over 40 years. Wimberg offers professional one-stop landscaping services from initial design and installation of all plant materials and hardscapes to ongoing maintenance, including lawn service, leaf and snow removal. Wimberg Landscaping. 513-271-2332 or on the web at wimberglandscaping.com. That's wimberglandscaping.com. St. Vincent de Paul, Northern Kentucky understands the importance of a helping hand when life becomes difficult. Through the grace of God and the amazing generosity of volunteers and donors, St. Vincent de Paul, Northern Kentucky has been able to provide over $200,000 in rent and utility assistance to nearly 2,000 neighbors in need in the last 12 weeks alone. The prayer is to continue to faithfully serve those in need well into the future. To learn how you can help, visit svdpnky.org and follow along on social media. Back with us now on the Sunrise Morning Show is Dr. Matthew Bunsen, Vice President and Editorial Director of EWTN News. He's the man behind the Doctors of the Church series for EWTN. Good morning, Dr. Bunsen. Good morning. Great to be with you. April 4th is the feast of St. Isidore of Seville, bishop and doctor of the church from the 6th century. Now, I was struggling to decide where to start in terms of the context of his life, which brings out such an incredible figure in the life of the church. So let's start with the political and cultural context first. Tell us about what was happening during his lifetime. Well, if we think of uh, Gregory the Great, who faced uh, a post-Roman world, so to speak, the the Roman Empire had collapsed. In Spain, it was uh, in many ways even worse, because not only did we have the end of the Roman Empire uh, and the the beautiful provinces of Rome that had existed for centuries, but uh, the Iberian Peninsula had been overrun by the Visigoths, who had been essentially forced from central Europe or Western Europe down into Spain and created uh, a series of kingdoms. 
Now, on top of that, not only did they in many ways obliterate an ancient Roman civilization, but they also brought with them Arianism. So they essentially were dedicated heretics. So it was in many ways for the, for the church the worst of all possible worlds. And this is the task that was given to bishops uh, to deal with what were known as the reges crenites. It was the long-haired kings. Uh, they had the two tasks of trying to get them to give up Arianism, but then also to rebuild some semblance of imperial civilization to hold, to find a glue that would bring everyone together. And, of course, faithful Orthodox Christianity was the path ahead. And that's where Isidore is so important. Incredibly important. So we have that groundwork laid. Now, the other major thing that we need to talk about is his family, and in particular, <laughs> yes. his brother, Leander. And so uh, Isidore himself was a part of uh, a family of this what's called Hispano-Roman culture. Uh, both of his parents, Severianus and Theodora, were of the nobility, at least some sort of uh, prominence. And boy, did they do a job raising their children, uh, because we have Isidore, who's a saint and a doctor of a church, but then we also have uh, one of his brothers, Fulgensis of Cartagena, who is a bishop who went on to become a saint. Then we have a sister, Florentina of Cartagena, who was a nun of some type, who went on to become a saint. And then we have another brother, Leander of Seville, uh, who was the bishop or archbishop of Seville, who helped raise and educate Isidore. He's also a saint. So we have four siblings, all four are saints. So it gives us an idea of just the remarkable job their parents did, but also how beautiful and strong the faith was, seemingly in the face of societal collapse, civilizational collapse, and religious collapse because of the Visigoths. Yeah, okay. Now talk about Isidore <laughs> and how he how he went up against all of this, because he was somebody that, like so many saints, struggled with the the desire to be a contemplative, but the call to be very active in ministry. <laughs> yeah. How many uh, doctors of the church and saints have we talked about over the years uh, who all they wanted to do was just give their lives to Christ, spend their lives in a monastery or a hermitage, but no, God called them out, and it was putting all of those gifts that God gave them to use for the church. So, Isidore succeeds his brother Leander around 600 or so as the Bishop of Seville, and he sets out uh, to build on the work of his brother, and that is to deal with the Visigoths, to bring all of the heretics back into the Church, but then also to build something of a unified culture out of, this, out of many broken pieces of the time. So he used a series of local church councils to do that, so the synods of Seville in particular. And then we also had national councils uh, in the Iberian Peninsula, in Hispania. And he did it a couple of ways. First was to educate, to create uh, educational systems, schools, and, and cathedral schools in particular, but then also to oversee the careful training of his priests. Uh, to establish these uh, missions and uh, places where people could come for help. But it was in that practical pastoral effort that he was especially significant. You asked about contemplation, and he once wrote that, just as we must love God in contemplation, so we have to love our neighbor with action. It's impossible to live without the presence of both the one and the other form of life, nor can we live without experiencing both the one and the other. He was beloved for his pastoral care of souls just as much as he was for his extraordinary learning. Mm. What do you think Isidore of Seville has to say to us today, Dr. Bunsen? Well, he was the author of the first great encyclopedia in certainly the history of uh, the West, uh, the Etymologiae, which was sort of the summation of all that we know. It's one of the reasons why he's considered uh, unofficially one of the patron saints of the Internet. It was all of that magnificent learning, but it just wasn't uh, for its own purpose. He, he gave all of this learning to God, but then he took that learning and applied it uh, to the saving of souls and the pastoral care of souls. So all of that has to come together 
all of that has to be a deep and profound expression of love and boy did he love the people of his time yeah and love the lord jesus saint isidore of seville pray for, pray for us. us we've been talking to dr matthew bunsen you can find the doctors of the church series linked at sunrisemorningshow.com dr bunsen thank you so much great to be with you it was great to have you yeah St. Isidore of Seville, the unofficial patron of the internet. I always invoke his intercession when, you know, the printer doesn't work or my internet's being slow or, you know, whatever. St. Isidore of Seville, pray for us. It's half past the hour now on the Sunrise Morning Show. It's time for news. The Biden administration has no plans to change its policy toward Israel after seven humanitarian aid workers were killed recently in an Israeli airstrike. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre told reporters, however, the president does expect a swift and thorough investigation into the incident. Meanwhile, President Biden will be holding a call with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today. Brian Shook has more. The expected call between the two leaders comes days after seven World Central Kitchen aid workers were killed in an Israeli attack in Gaza. Biden said he was outraged by the incident and urged Israel to do more to protect civilians in Gaza as Israeli forces wage war on Hamas. Netanyahu said the strike on aid workers was unintentional and an investigation is underway. I'm Brian Shook. During his general audience yesterday, Pope Francis Francis appealed again for peace in the Holy Land. He said, I renew my appeal for the exhausted and suffering civilian population to be allowed access to humanitarian aid and for the hostages to be released immediately. Let us avoid any irresponsible attempts to escalate the conflict in the region, he added, calling for tireless efforts to put an end to this and other wars that continue to bring death and suffering to so many parts of the world. He also upheld and renewed his appeal for peace in Ukraine. The Holy Father, in his catechesis, focused on the virtue of justice at the general audience. Vatican News reports the Holy Father pointed out that this is not just an individual virtue, but a social one, and said justice is fundamental for peaceful coexistence. Meanwhile, church officials in Syria are decrying a recent Israeli drone in Damascus. From Vatican Radio, Linda Bordoni reports. Archbishop Samir Nassar condemned the Israeli strike on the Iranian embassy in Damascus as a deadly attack that risks worsening the situation for Syrians who face enormous and growing needs. The Maronite Archbishop of Aleppo described the situation in Syria as a forgotten reality, where people, he said, are constantly searching for a piece of bread fuel, all kinds of medicine, to solve even the smallest problem. The Israeli raid on the Iranian consulate building in Damascus on Monday killed 13 people. Israel accuses them of supplying weapons to Hezbollah militias in Lebanon. The attack and the Iranian leaders' vow to punish Israel for the raid have raised concern that the war in Gaza threatens to escalate major conflict across the region. Prior to Monday's raid in Damascus, Israel reportedly struck targets in the north of Syria where the apostolic vicar of Aleppo told Asia News some 35 people were killed in an attack. Bishop Hana Yalouf was at pains to thank Pope Francis for having reminded the international community of the ongoing conflict in Syria, a conflict that has protracted for over 13 years and is mostly forgotten, he said, as emphasised by Pope Francis on Easter Sunday. Indeed, after all these years, Bishop Yalouf said, the world seems to have forgotten Syria, but there is still a war here. And to this are added the devastation caused by the earthquake in 2023. Let us pray with the Pope. The bishop concluded that the weapons be silenced and that there is no escalation that also overwhelms Lebanon and cascading leads to a regional and global war. I'm Linda Bordoni. Another Alabama hospital plans on stopping all in vitro fertilization procedures by the end of this year. On Wednesday, the Mobile Infirmary said it will no longer be able to offer in vitro fertilization due to litigation concerns surrounding the procedure. The decision follows Alabama's Supreme Court ruling that anyone who destroys frozen human embryos can be held liable for wrongful death 
and IVF regularly involves the destruction of human embryos. After the court's decision back in February, three hospitals stopped offering IVF the following week. And the first person in the world to receive a pig kidney transplant is heading home after a successful surgery. Rick Slayman of Massachusetts received a pig kidney in late March. The 62-year-old was living with end-stage kidney disease along with type 2 diabetes and hypertension and already had a human kidney transplant in 2018. That's the news. It's 35 past the hour. Experience the Mass by Candlelight with Gregorian chant, polyphony, and other music from the Church's tradition of sacred music every second Sunday at St. Susanna Church in Mason. For more information, visit sacredheartradio.com slash events. This is Chris Knockelman, owner of Schneller Knockelman, Plumbing, Heating, and Air. Our family has been a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio for more than a decade, and we encourage other businesses to do the same. Find us at skpha.com, skpha.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Hoting Realtors. The trusted professionals at Hoting Realtors have been serving neighbors, family, and friends in the tri-state Catholic communities for over 30 years. 513-451-4800 and at Hoting.com. Working to see the culture of life prevail in the Miami Valley, Dayton Right to Life is here to protect God's gift of life through law, education, and community action, from fertilization to natural death. Find Dayton Right to Life online at DaytonLife.org. That's DaytonLife.org. It's 24 minutes before the hour on this Thursday in the octave of Easter, the Feast of St. Isidore of Seville, April the 4th. Your forecast is brought to you on Sacred Heart Catholic Radio by Schneller Knockman Plumbing, Heating, and Air online at skpha.com. Going to see snow today. Right now, it's kind of cold with temperatures in the mid-30s as you're heading out the door. For Cincinnati, overcast with spotty light showers and a high of 44. Overcast with a slight chance for some showers tonight and an overnight low of 33. Cloudy and cool with isolated afternoon showers tomorrow and a high of 47. For the Miami Valley Dayton area, rain and snow this morning, then rain this afternoon and a high of 45. Cloudy with a few rain or snow showers tonight and a low of 34. Cloudy with a slight chance of rain or snow tomorrow and a high of 47 degrees. This is Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. It's 37 minutes past the hour. You're listening to the Sunrise Morning Show on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. So happy to have you along with us on this Feast of St. Isidore of Seville, Thursday in the Octave of Easter. Don Buettner is joining us now on the Sunrise Morning Show. She's author of quite a few books on the saints. The one I've got in front of me is called The Leaven of the Saints, Bringing Christ into a Fallen World. But she's here to talk about a book she didn't write. It's called Too Small a World, The Life of Mother Frances Cabrini by the late Theodore Maynard. Don, welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's good to have you. So this was re-released by Ignatius Press with a new foreword written by Cardinal Timothy Dolan of New York, uh, obviously coinciding with the release of the rather popular uh, Cabrini movie. So tell us a little bit about Theodore Maynard, the author, and why did he write this biography of Mother Cabrini? How did he go about doing it? So uh, Theodore Maynard was born in India, but his parents were Protestant missionaries, um, but he, they, he had, they had him educated in England. Uh, he, was, uh, um, he eventually became a poet, a historian, a, a writer, but when he was young, he converted to the faith. He was influenced by G.K. Chesterton, um, became a, a real, a very strong intellectual, um, uh, but also very articulate in his ability to defend the faith. So he, uh, he came to this country as a, a kind of young man. Um, and he, he became a popular poet, um, but he also married and eventually had seven children. So I think he needed to um, uh, uh, find a more lucrative com- uh, 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 occupation. Uh, so he also started to write a, a number of Catholic biographies. And the one that he wrote, um, th- this particular one, was one of his bestsellers. It was very popular. 
Um, I think it's a great biography, and um, and and I'm I'm really excited that Ignatius decided to reprint it, reprint it. Yeah. So you've written a number of books, as I said, uh, about the saints. What stands out to you about the life of Mother Cabrini? Uh, well, what I love about Mother Cabrini, as is described in this uh, particular book, um, it, she, she's the, the movie portrays her as very strong, and that is certainly something that people encountered when they met Mother Cabrini. Sure. A, a interesting, two interesting things that, that really came out in this book, um, I thought, was the fact that she was shrewd and charming. Hmm. That she's this, she was born three months premature, so she was you know like four foot nothing. She was this short woman, you know, who you know spoke with an Italian accent, and when she came to America. Um, but she was perfectly able to make herself, you know, known, understood by other people. And what, what time and again, what Theodore Maynard points out is how charming she was. She'd get on a boat and she's in like third class in the middle of the boat, but she'd go talk to the captain and just was so friendly and kind to him that he'd like bump her up to first class. You know, it was it was that kind of, <laughs> of, of ability that she had. You know, some people just have the gift of the gab and she used it. She used her superpower for good. She always used it, you know, to advance the church because she loved the Lord so much. The other characteristic that I really love about St. Francis Cabrini is um, that she was shrewd. I mean, she um, she was from a poor family. She knew the value of money. You gave her money, and she made the most out of it. When she would, and, and she could have been a real estate tycoon. They, the way that uh, Theodore Manor describes her, she she would enter a city, and she knew that she wanted to establish a community there, you know, an orphanage. But she wouldn't just, you know, pick some place that somebody assigned her. You know, there's just an abandoned building. She would be careful. She would, she would, you know, look at the. She would walk around the city. She would talk to people. She would, you know, get familiar with it, and then she would choose a place. And invariably, she cho- chose locations that were, uh, like, you know, re- you know, that increased in value dramatically. It was it was a, an excellent way that she had of choosing her properties. But also, she wouldn't let herself be. Um, uh, uh, swindled by people who actually did try to swindle a a Roman Catholic nun, but mm. she, she was very shrewd in that way in in knowing that these you know the the money that she was given was for God and she was very careful with it. Yeah, and you talk about how she used all of these skills for the good. I mean, she never got too big for her britches, did she? She always loved the least of these. Oh, exactly, and that's why um, she was able. She started off in. Italy as a teacher, and she knew, you know, from the from the earliest days that God wanted her to do more than just stay a a religious, you know, sister in, you know, start this order just in Italy. She knew that God wanted her to go farther, but she knew it was all because of Him. So she would go into a a, a new city. Um, she would, you know, you know, try to work with the people who were there, but she was always looking further because she wanted to spread the gospel. It was all about, you know, serving the poor wherever they needed to be. She was, and, and the fact that she had no money, no political power, that didn't stop her the least little bit. She knew it was all focused on what God wanted her to do. Kind of a um, Mother Teresa sort of story, it seems like. Oh, exactly. Like one of the controversies that has come up about, you know, the the... the uh, the movie has been this idea that you know there have been pl- plenty of people who who understand you know church history as well or much better than me have pointed out that there have been plenty of religious sisters who've traveled throughout the world. But what was unique about Mother Cabrini was that she, from the beginning, saw herself as a missionary sister, mm-hmm. and that you know I, I mean they they just would be would have been perfectly happy the hierarchy would have been perfectly happy if she just stayed stayed in Italy. But she knew that God was calling her to more. Similarly, you know Mother. Um, Mother Teresa, I think, uh, is an excellent example of like, she built on the footsteps of Mother Cabrini, this idea. She called her, her sisters the missionaries of charity. The same idea that we spread the love, you know, you know, you know, the sisters can spread love, too, you know, by serving the poor. Do you think she lived up to the name Francis Xavier as a missionary? Oh, Oh, exactly. I mean, and um, she was really unstoppable. She, in the biography, it points out how she went to different places. Another thing I really respect her for is I, the, the book cleared up a lot of, mis, of, of questions that I had, like, mm. you know, why did she go to South America? Because people invited her. They found out how successful she was. But then she adapted her, um, her technique based on the needs of that community. So in South America, they had no religious schools. There was nothing. So, you know, those schools were, they called them fee-paying schools. So they were uh, schools for, uh, you know, the um, people who had more money. Um, and, 
and, and were established in community because they had nothing. So with the idea that, okay, we educate the children of the rich, then it makes it possible for us to educate the children of the poor. So she really was very foresighted in how yeah. she she chose to spread her her um, her, her order. Well, Don, the saints are timeless, and I, I know you know this, that, that they find us oftentimes before we even know that we need them. Why do you think that now is the right time for Mother Cabrini to make, I guess you could say, a bit of a comeback in the American church today? Oh, well— uh, I think one of the things that the movie points out is, you know, the 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 idea that a a strong woman can, you know, can do anything. I mean, anything that you know, with God's grace, um, there's like there's some timeless message that particularly resonates in us. But her also her humility, her ability to go anywhere, um, because she was willing to deal with the poorest of the poor. That's a, a message that you know she she. And, and the other issues, a popular issue today is, you know, sadly, you know, controversial issue is is immigration. Well. One of the things that you know nobody seems to remember is you, you think of um, how the, the book points out how many Italian immigrants came to this country, and explains why they did that because of the unrest in their country. Um, uh, Padre Pio's father came to America, and the reason that he did that was because he knew that he could not afford to you know, you know feed his family, but also send Padre Pio to. Um, to uh, the seminary and let him be a priest if he did not, you know, make more money than was possible for him to do in Italy. So he spent several years in America, made money, came in return to his family. So we would not have, uh, um, you know, Padre Pio uh, as a, a saint of the church. So that in some ways they're all kind of related. You know, they help one, they help eat all of us, but they also help one another grow in holiness in ways that none of us can tell. Wow. We've been talking to Don Butner about the biography of Mother Frances Cabrini called Too Small a World. It's by Theodore Maynard, the late Theodore Maynard, and has been re-released by Ignatius Press with the new forward by Cardinal Timothy Dolan. And Don, just really appreciate you coming on to talk about this book. We'd love to have you back sometime soon to talk about your books. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Have a great day. You do the same. Thank you. All right, it is uh, 14 till now on the Sunrise Morning Show, and our Catholic counselor, Kevin Prendergast, joins us next. Support is from Solidarity Health Share. Do you have an insurance plan that pays for everything, even things that violate your beliefs? Have you ever felt there has to be a better way, but didn't know you had any options? If you answered yes, I've got some good news for you. There is a better way and a more affordable way. Solidarity Health Share can save you hundreds of dollars each month while actually supporting your beliefs. Because the best news is that Solidarity HealthShare costs a whole lot less than insurance. It's time to jump in and put your money where your faith is and put some money back into your wallet at the same time. Join Solidarity HealthShare, a faith-based healthcare sharing community. Prices start as low as $384 a month for families. Call to see how much you can save, 844-334-3245. That's 844-334-3245. Solidarity Health Share, 844-334-3245. Happy Easter. We're celebrating the resurrection and the Carmelite monks of Wyoming have some special coffee blends in honor of our risen Lord, including Easter sunrise and Pascha Java. And when you purchase Easter-themed beverages through the Mystic Monk Coffee link at sunrisemorningshow.com, we earn a commission. While you're at our site, be sure to check out our online store to get a Sunrise Morning Show mug or travel mug. Grab a mug and link to the Mystic Monks for your Easter coffee at sonrisemorningshow.com. One of the reasons we should go to Mass is because it is the food of the saints that we receive. And for the saints, they understood rightly that the time after Holy Communion, that those moments are the most precious moments of our lives. The Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, live from the EWTN Chapel, every morning, 8 Eastern, on EWTN Radio and Television. Getting ready for Divine Mercy Sunday. That's later on Take Two with Jerry and Debbie on most of these EWTN stations. Now back to the Sunrise Morning Show with Anna Mitchell and Matt Swain. It's 11 till now on the Sunrise Morning Show. Let's take a look at headlines. 
President Biden has a call scheduled with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today, but the administration has said that there are no plans to change its policy toward Israel after humanitarian aid workers were killed in a recent Israeli airstrike. During his general audience yesterday, Pope Francis appealed again for peace in the Holy Land as well as in Ukraine and in his general audience catechesis focused on the virtue of justice. Next newscast in about 13-ish minutes from now as the Sunrise Morning Show continues here on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Our Catholic counselor, Kevin Prendergast, is back with us now on the Sunrise Morning Show. He's a licensed counselor, former seminary instructor. Kevin, good morning. Hey, and I hope your Easter season is going wonderfully. So far, so good. Christ okay. is risen. Alleluia. So yep. uh, in addition to celebrating Easter, um, this Easter octave, April uh, on the, I guess you could say, secular calendar is mm-hmm. Alcohol Awareness Month. And so we're going to take a look at that from a Catholic perspective. Mm-hmm. And I guess the first question is, Kevin, I mean, we know that alcohol in and of itself is not sinful. Jesus mm-hmm. drank wine. Um, so how do you determine when it's a problem? Yeah, I think our question today is, uh, can I be, am I a social drinker or is it causing problems? So that's mm-hmm. where we're going. The catechism uses this word temperance. So in 2290, it says the virtue of temperance disposes us to avoid every kind of excess. And they give examples, food, alcohol, tobacco, medicine. <clears throat> so again, Jesus was accused in the gospels of being a drunkard, right? <laughs> because he didn't fast the same way that the Jews did. He apparently drank wine. Uh, so in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with alcohol. Uh, but some of us, you know, a certain percentage of us um, misuse it and it, it gets control of us. That's what we're talking about here. So what does temperance and moderation mean exactly? So, so on the one hand, you know, the CDC has some good guidelines. And if you talk to your doctor, you're going to hear exactly the same thing. So they define social drinking for men is an average of no more than two drinks a day over a week, right? Not going over more than two drinks in a day. And that doesn't mean pouring a big tumbler or, (laughs) you know, a gallon jug and and calling that a drink. And then for women, it's one, right? Mm. Now that seems pretty mild, but it's still, so I never tell people to stop drinking, but the question I look at is, well, how many times are you going over that limit? That's a good health limit. And you could check with your doctor if you if you don't believe that. But then, you know, some other problems are, you know, in the U.S. population, again, the statistics are that probably 17 percent, you know, which is a good percentage of people of adults who drink engage in binge drinking. So mm-hmm. what's binge drinking? That's a very specific number. When I ask clients that are having trouble with alcohol, they say, well, binge is going on for days and days for a whole weekend drinking. That's not really what it is. It's five, you know, measured drinks of of beer, wine, whatever, uh, and in a, in a certain setting. So I sit down and I have five over a two or three hour period. So what that's going to do to my body is that Everybody, no matter how big or small you are, you're going to be over the legal limit in most states for drinking, for driving. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that, so binge drinking is really getting drunk. Uh, And, you know, 17 percent is a large amount. And then there's another 7 percent of people who maybe they don't engage in binge drinking, but they drink every day pretty heavily over that two drinks a day, one drink a day. So so that would be one, like just from a health point of view, and just talk with your doctor about that. I think your doctor would encourage you to moderate your drinking. That would be one. The other one that's, I think, even more important is we talk about problem drinking. What's problem drinking? It means that my drinking sometimes causes me problems or often causes problems. Mm. So do I get into more arguments when I've been drinking uh, with my spouse? is my spouse complaining about my drinking. So just from doing a lot of marriage counseling over the years, Annie, 
uh, there's lots of things that spouses can complain about, you know, <laughs> yeah. but when they start bringing up alcohol, that's really a, a smoking gun there, right? There's yeah. something going on there. People yeah. don't usually accuse their spouse of drinking too much unless there really is a problem. I did want to ask, yeah, um, because, well, just speaking of, of the spouse part <clears throat> of it, <clears throat> mm-hmm. um, if you're more likely to be told that you have a problem or are you more likely to to come to yourself and realize that you have a problem okay so there's somebody out there in our our listening audience which understands what i'm going to say right now is that when our drinking is out of control and it's causing problems uh, we tend to feel embarrassed ashamed uh out of control So maybe we've made a lot of attempts to cut back or to stop, and they just haven't been successful. We haven't managed to stay stopped. And so when other people bring up our drinking, we tend to be very defensive and angry. Mm -hmm. Mind your own business. I can stop whenever I want. So it's that, you know, shame mixed with resentment and defensiveness. Uh, So that's kind of a clue right there. And then, you know, if it's if it's starting to cause us what you're asking about spouses and if we have somebody that we love who seems to be drinking too much, what doesn't work? Nagging will make it worse. It just doesn't work. Uh, Al-Anon, which is a group, a support group for for people who love somebody who has a drinking problem. They, they talk about these three C's that you didn't cause it. You can't control it and you can't cure it. So that really you need to focus on yourself. And that's why I think alcoholism, it's a medical disease. It's probably some biological genetic roots, but it's also a spiritual disease, Annie. It it erodes our capacity to think about others, to be useful, uh, to live in service, uh, and it destroys our relationship. So for the, the alcoholic needs to do something, the problem drinker needs to do something, but we need to do something. If we're concerned, we, there's two feelings that... I think come up a lot if we know somebody loves somebody who has an alcohol problem is one we're afraid we're afraid of where that's going to go mm-hmm. is it going to ruin our are we going to lose the marriage is it going to hurt the kids are we going to lose the job uh, what's going to happen but the other one is resentment that we are just uh, eaten up and we're, we focus on the person who has the drinking problem instead of focusing on ourself and that's where we could turn to a priest a counselor and try to see how can i change these feelings of uh, fear and resentment and try to be more useful uh, to to set some boundaries uh, yeah. maybe to detach but detach with love uh, so how do I how do I love this person but set some good boundaries find some good support as you were saying from a priest mm-hmm. or a counselor Catholics in recovery Alcoholics yep. Anonymous you mentioned Great. Al-Anon yep. as well good stuff from our Catholic counselor Kevin <clears throat> Prendergast for Alcohol Awareness Month Kevin thank you so much Thanks, Annie. Have a great day. You do the same. Thank you. All right. We got another hour of the Sunrise Morning Show coming up for most of our affiliates here on EWTN Radio. Thank you for supporting Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. Yes, because of your generosity and from inviting many others to listen and give is why Sacred Heart Radio is now heard and seen on seven media platforms. Now, if you are a new listener, setting up a reoccurring gift of just $10 a month is easy to do at sacredheartradio.com and we'll assure that the gospel of Jesus Christ will always be broadcast on Sacred Heart Radio and the Sacred Heart Radio app. I am Deacon Mike Erb with Coldwell Banker Realty, proud to support Sacred Heart Radio because I am a faithful listener and I'm happy to help you with buying or selling your home. 513-237-8888. That's 513-237-8888. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Molly Maid of Westchester. With 30 years of trusted, quality service and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. 1 800 Molly Made or at MollyMade.com. Molly Made, a clean you can trust. I'm Bill Torbeck of Tri State Abrasive and Tool Company, proud to support Sacred Heart Radio. Diamond and CBN are the most advanced cutting tools because they are the hardest materials known. These enable you to machine three to eight times faster compared to carbide while reducing downtime for tool changes by 90%. Improve your productivity when machining hard, cast, and powdered metals or difficult to machine materials. Find out more at theabrasiveone.com. That's the number one, theabrasiveone.com. Hi, this is John Kennedy, a State Farm agent and a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio. If you need life insurance, I can help process the best options for you and your family. 
You can reach me at 859-485-2000 or online at johnkennedyinsurance.com. Pregnancy Center West is committed to protecting the unborn by encouraging women to see and choose the beauty of life while offering practical assistance for them and their families. Donate securely online at supportpcw.org. That's supportpcw.org. You rely on your car, so rely on the experts at Fort Mitchell Garage, a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio. They can do it all from brakes, tires, and heating and cooling to towing and collision repair and more. Fort Mitchell Garage on Dixie Highway and Park Hills. On the web at fortmitchellgarage.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Twin Dental of Cincinnati. Since 1986, twin brothers Drs. David and Michael Rothen have been providing superior dental care in a relaxed and comfortable setting for the entire family. The twin dental doctors utilize advanced dentistry techniques from sedation to implants and the latest in cosmetic options to preserve and beautify smiles. Twin Dental, located just off the I-275 exit at Hamilton Avenue. For a complimentary evaluation, 513-825-6111 and online at twindental.com. This is Archbishop Dennis Schnur from the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. Thank you for listening to Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. 740 WNOP Newport, 910 WPFB Middletown, or get the app, stream, podcast, and more at sacredheartradio.com. Arise, it's a new day. Hear his word, let us pray. The sunrise morning. We're continuing our way on this Thursday, April the 4th, the Feast of St. Isidore of Seville and Thursday within the octave of Easter. Christ rose from the dead and is always present in his church. Let us adore him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Stay with us, Lord. Lord Jesus, victor over sin and death, glorious and immortal, be always in our midst. Come to us in the power of your victory and show our hearts the loving kindness of your Father. Come to heal a world wounded by division, for you alone can transform our hearts and make them one. Strengthen our faith in final victory and renew our hope in your second coming. Lord, hear the prayers we offer in commemoration of St. Isidore. May your church learn from his teaching and benefit from his intercession. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, and welcome to Hour 2 of the Sunrise Morning Show here on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. I'm Anna Mitchell, sitting in the studios of Sacred Heart Catholic Radio in Cincinnati, Ohio, along with Paul Lockman at the controls and Travis Smith, who has the video feed up and running. You can find it at sonrisemorningshow.com if you'd like to watch the Sunrise Morning Show. Matt Swaim on spring break this week. Up this hour, Dr. John Bergsma continues our series on his book, Love Basics for Catholics. We've been getting Lessons for marriage today from the various stories that uh, we find in the Bible. And today we're going to be talking about Ruth and Boaz. Rita Heikenfeld has a recipe to help you use up the rest of that Easter ham that might still be sitting in your fridge as we talk about saffron in Bible foods. Gary Machuda is going to continue our series on the gospel truth. And conveniently enough, the section that we are on as we go through this book um, is about the dating of Easter. So we'll talk about that controversy in the church and why that is no indicator (laughs) that uh, anything about Christianity is untrue. And then we'll wrap things up for the hour with Dr. Jeffrey Morrow continuing our Old Testament Bible study. Today we are talking about the book of the prophet Amos. Right now it's three minutes past and news is a service of Central Fabricators and centralfabricators.com. The Biden administration has no plans to change its policy toward Israel after seven humanitarian aid workers were killed in a recent Israeli airstrike. 
White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre told reporters, however, the president expects a a swift and thorough investigation into the incident. Biden, in a statement Tuesday, said he was outraged and heartbroken by the killing of seven World Central Kitchen humanitarian workers who were delivering, and he delivered some strong criticism of Israel, some of the strongest criticism since the start of the war against Hamas. But Biden added he will continue to push Israel to protect civilians. He is facing pressure to stop providing Israel weapons in the war. During his general audience yesterday, Pope Francis appealed again for peace in the Holy Land. From Vatican Radio, Devin Watkins reports. Reflecting on the war in the Holy Land, the Pope lamented the tragic news that continues to come from the Middle East. I reiterate, said the Holy Father, my firm request for an immediate ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. The Holy Father expressed his deep regret for the staff members killed as they distributed humanitarian aid in Gaza and reassured his prayers for them and their families. On Tuesday, Israeli airstrikes killed seven aid workers in Gaza who were delivering food with the U.S.-based charity World Central Kitchen. Those killed included three British nationals, an Australian, a Polish national, an American-Canadian dual citizen, and a Palestinian. I renew, said the Pope, my appeal for the exhausted and suffering civilian population to be allowed access to humanitarian aid and for the hostages to be released immediately. Let us avoid any irresponsible attempts to escalate the conflict in the region, he added, calling for tireless efforts to put an end to this and other wars that continue to bring death and suffering to so many parts of the world. I'm Devin Watkins. Pope Francis focused on the virtue of justice at his general audience yesterday as he continued his catechesis series on virtues and vices. Vatican News reports the Holy Father pointed out this is not just an individual virtue but a social one. He said justice is fundamental for peaceful coexistence, saying where justice is not respected, conflicts arise. Without justice, he said the law of the prevalence of the strong over the weak is entrenched. Another Alabama hospital plans on stopping all IVF by the end of this year. On Wednesday, Mobile Infirmary said it will no longer be able to offer in vitro fertilization due to litigation concerns surrounding it. The decision follows Alabama's Supreme Court ruling that anyone who destroys frozen human embryos can be held liable for wrongful death, and IVF regularly involves the destruction of human embryos. After the court's decision back in February, three hospitals stopped offering IVF procedures the following week. And the first person in the world to receive a pig kidney transplant is heading home after a successful surgery. Rick Slayman of Massachusetts received a pig kidney late March. The 62-year-old was living with end-stage kidney disease along with type 2 diabetes and hypertension and already had a human kidney transplant in 2018. The new kidney was genetically altered to remove harmful pig genes and add certain human genes to improve its compatibility. Sounds like I need to get Father Tad Pakulchik from the National Catholic Bioethics Center on here to talk about this because, wow, what a world. A pig kidney. Wow. Well, today is Thursday, April the 4th. It is Thursday in the octave of Easter and also the feast of St. Isidore of Seville, bishop and doctor of the church, unofficial patron of the internet. And if you have any computer problems, go to Isidore. Go to Isidore. St. Isidore, pray for us. Back with us now on the Sunrise Morning Show is Dr. John Bergsma. We have been going through his book, Love Basics for Catholics. Good morning, Doc. Good morning, Anna. It's good to have you back. And we're talking today about lessons for our marriages from the story of Ruth and Boaz. Now, just as a bit of a refresher, will you give us the rundown of their love story? Absolutely. So... We recall that uh, the family of Naomi, uh, Ruth's mother-in-law, 
um, had to go out to Moab because of a famine. And there, uh, the men folk married Moabite women, and that included Ruth. And then we had that big famine. And, um, uh, but there was food in Moab, so they uh, were able to survive. And then they come back to Bethlehem when the famine is over. And they're looking to support themselves. And Ruth runs into that wonderful guy, Boaz, who is, in fact, uh, a relative and one of the men in her family uh, to whom the responsibility would fall to marry her on the demise of her late husband. And so that little romance develops in Ruth chapter 2, and then things get a little bit steamy in Ruth chapter 3, and uh, they realize that they've got sparks for one another. And so in Ruth chapter 4, they get married, and they are blessed with children, and they become the uh, great-great-grandparents of King David, in fact. And so it's a beautiful little story where, um, where Ruth is very faithful to her mother-in-law, Naomi. And in Hebrew, there's a special word for that kind of faithfulness. It's hesed. It's mm-hmm. like being faithful to your covenant. And, uh, and Boaz, likewise, is very faithful to his commitment to his extended family. And as they both follow the path of faithfulness, it leads them to each other. And uh, so it's the perfect little biblical rom-com. Yeah, it is the perfect little biblical rom-com. And one that leads to the, you know, the, the well, the the king. The, you, know, you talk yes. about this in, in the book in relation to the importance of marriage as the, the fundamental building block of society. Sure. I mean, the whole problem at the beginning of Ruth is that they're in the period of the judges, which is this period of moral chaos and relativism and uh, social confusion. And to get out of that, you need a good leader. Well, good leaders just don't fall out of the sky. Uh, they got to be formed, and they got to be formed with uh, good families and good family life. And so the future of the nation really depends on parents like Boaz and Ruth raising up uh, children uh, like the ancestors of David who will follow God's law and keep fidelity, keep faithfulness towards one another and towards their obligations to their family members and and society and to the rest of the people of God. And so, yeah, it's the future of the nation goes by way of the family, as St. John Paul II used to like to say. Yeah, it's through the family where we learn to live in community. I do find it interesting. You talk about the faithfulness to God's law and and particularly the faithfulness to God's law concerning others. I think we've talked about this before on the show, Dr. Bergsma, but it's because Boaz was following the law of God concerning um, his fields and and gleaning that he was able to meet Ruth at all, right? I mean, you you look at all that came about because he followed this law that, you know, some probably weren't following. And I I think there's a lesson there, too. Absolutely. I mean, he's following the law of God, which said that, you know, you have to care for the orphan and the widow and leave the edges of your field unharvested so that they have grain to glean. And he not only does that, but he goes above and beyond and even tells his workers to pull out a few sheaves and throw them out for those who are gleaning. And his faithfulness to what, you know, God's law said to have charity towards the poor and the underprivileged, that faithfulness to God's law leads him to his spouse. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's it really is quite beautiful how two people who— um, we're not thinking about themselves, and we're thinking about others, and we're thinking about, you know, faithfulness to their their obligations um, uh, to other people that were worse off than them, and then they end up fighting each other and having one of the happiest marriages uh, in Scripture, which leads ultimately to the salvation of their whole nation by raising up uh, a royal dynasty. Yeah. 
I was going to say, I mean, we, we say that David eventually came from it, but, but really Jesus did. Yeah, absolutely. And unwittingly, Ruth and Boaz are kind of living out in advance that beautiful vision of marriage that St. Paul will talk about later in Ephesians 5. And uh, they become types of Christ in the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm curious what you think, Dr. Bergsma, because we've talked about the importance of marrying within a religious community. We talked about that earlier um, when it came to, I believe we were talking about Abraham and Isaac and um, and and their family. And yet we have an instance here, Ruth, a, a, a pagan, right? I mean, she was a Moabite, which meant that she was not part of, of the people of Israel, but then decided to kind of um, glean in to uh, the people of, of God through marriage, um, which I think, you know, as you say, as you have said, it's not the ideal circumstance, but, but sometimes when you have a, a faithful Catholic and somebody who's not Catholic getting married, it, it can add to the, the body of Christ. Yeah, in the case of Ruth, we have that beautiful oath that she swears to Naomi in Ruth chapter 2, where she says, your people will be my people, and your God my God. And uh, she's really, that's really a kind of conversion there, yeah. where she is giving up her Moabite religion, and she's adopting the religion of her mother-in-law, Naomi. And, um, and then, you know, Boaz is touched by that in chapter uh, 2, and, you know, he comes and says, you know, may the Lord bless you under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Mm -hmm. And then I think we've talked before on the show about how that uh, leads into chapter 3, where uh, the wing of his garment uh, becomes the expression of God's protection when she says, throw the wing of your garment over me. So Boaz becomes expression of God's protection for this woman who's got to come to take refuge from the God of Israel. Very beautiful. It's very beautiful. Speaking of beautiful, I'm holding up for our video audience here the uh, stick figure drawings of Ruth and Boaz and a baby <laughs> King David. So Ruth has got her uh, sheath of, of grains and baby David has a little crown and what is this, a bottle and a rattle in his hand? It's just darling. It's just darling, Dr. Bergsma. Love your illustrations you. in these books. Love Basics for Catholics, linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Dr. Bergsma, thank you so much. You're welcome. Talk to you next time. Sounds good. All right, it's 16 past now on the Sunrise Morning Show. We're back with headlines right after this. Support is from Solidarity Health Share. Do you have an insurance plan that pays for everything? even things that violate your beliefs? Have you ever felt there has to be a better way, but didn't know you had any options? If you answered yes, I've got some good news for you. There is a better way and a more affordable way. Solidarity HealthShare can save you hundreds of dollars each month while actually supporting your beliefs. Because the best news is that Solidarity HealthShare costs a whole lot less than insurance. It's time to jump in and put your money where your faith is and put some money back into your wallet at the same time. Join Solidarity HealthShare, a faith-based healthcare sharing community. Prices start as low as $384 a month for families. Call to see how much you can save, 844-334-3245. That's 844-334-3245. Solidarity HealthShare, 844-334-3245. Business owners are starting to think outside the box to find new customers. You can reach millions of engaged Catholic listeners by underwriting the Sunrise Morning Show. Each weekday morning, listeners across the U.S. and around the globe can hear your message for your business, ministry, or nonprofit on the Sunrise Morning Show. To find out how it works, email me, Leah, at sacredheartradio.com. That's Leah at sacredheartradio.com. Bible in a Year with me, Father Mike Schmitz, is now available right here on Catholic Radio. Encounter God's voice and learn how to live life through the lens of Scripture with a new episode every day. I hope you'll join me as we discover how the story of salvation unfolds and how we fit into that story today. Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year with Father Mike Schmitz. Tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, 
on EWTN Radio. 18 past now on the Sunrise Morning Show. Let's take a look at headlines. President Biden has a call scheduled with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today, this coming after seven humanitarian aid workers were killed in a recent Israeli airstrike. During his general audience yesterday, Pope Francis appealed again for peace in the Holy Land as well as in Ukraine and in his Catechesis continued his series on virtues and vices, focusing this time on the virtue of justice. Next newscast at the bottom of the hour, about 11 minutes from now, as the Sunrise Morning Show continues here on EWTN Radio. I mentioned this last hour, but want to uh, revisit it. I was uh, reading it. If you're in the uh, patristics course that I helped moderate for the Institute of Catholic Culture, Uh, You got this in an email yesterday. Um, I was reading Sermon 235 by St. Augustine, which is his reflection on the road to Emmaus. And yesterday, that particular gospel was um, the one that we heard at daily mass. Today, we hear kind of the postlude to that when uh, they come back and tell the disciples and then Jesus appears to them and asks to eat some some food, and they give him broiled fish. But anyway, I was reading about uh, Augustine's thoughts on the road to Emmaus and how they were so downtrodden, these disciples, as, as they were walking to Emmaus because, you know, they had forgotten everything that Jesus said. Jesus had predicted that he would suffer and die and then ra- rise again and and they just forgot because they were so downcast by the crucifixion itself. I mean, understandably so, I, I think. But um, anyway, they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. And St. Augustine says, So the Lord made himself present in the breaking of the bread. Learn where to look for the Lord. Learn to have him. Learn where to recognize him. It's when you eat him. Remember that as you approach the table of the Lord this morning. It's 21 past. Cooperative advertising. It's used by businesses that include the mention of a manufacturer of a product who in turn repays the business for part of the cost of their ad. A good example might be an insurance agent mentioning the brand name insurance she sells in her ad. Co-op ads are a cost-effective way your business can reach customers. And at Sacred Heart Radio, we've had a few underwriters who've used co-op advertising to assist in the cost of their underwriting. You want to learn more? Email me, Leah, at sacredheartradio.com. I am Deacon Mike Erb with Coldwell Banker Realty. Proud to support Sacred Heart Radio because I am a faithful listener, and I'm happy to help you with buying or selling your home. 513-237-8888. That's 513-237-8888. Hi, I'm Anna Mitchell, MC for Heartbeats for Life 5K, sponsored by Cincinnati Right to Life, Saturday, April 20th at Lunkin Airport Playfield. It's a day of food, family, and fun to keep hearts beating in Ohio. Register at CincinnatiRightToLife.org. Central Fabricators, proud supporters of Sacred Heart Radio, custom builds and repairs corrosion-resistant storage tanks, reactors, and pressure vessels. These are used to manufacture liquids used in everyday products like health and beauty aids, pharmaceuticals, and food. Central Fabricators uses the latest in technology and modern equipment to deliver quality products, and big orders are not a problem. Central Fabricators, ASME certified, and on the web at centralfabricators.com. That's centralfabricators.com. A wedding is a day. A marriage is a lifetime. Catholic Engaged Encounter Weekends are a marriage preparation program led by married couples and a priest or deacon. This is time for a couple to learn about each other and their upcoming marriage. Based on communication, intimacy, and the family they grew up in. Find out more at cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. That's cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. Twenty-three minutes past the hour, you're listening to the Sunrise Morning Show, and it's time for Bible Foods with Rita Heikenfeld from AboutEating.com. Good morning, Rita. Well, good morning, Miss Annie. So nice to talk to you, and I hope you still have some peeps left in the kids' baskets. 
Uh, you know what? I'm not a peeps person myself. I'm more uh, into the, the Reese's eggs and... Um, you know what? I like Starburst jelly beans. Oh, my gosh. I got those for the first time this year. Uh, so, yes. Yeah. I'm there with you. But we are talking about stuff <laughs> that's even better for you, that being saffron. Mm-hmm. And uh, now I have to say this is something that I don't use very often in cooking. Well, actually, I'm not sure that I've ever used saffron in cooking because it's so darn expensive. But where does mm-hmm. it show up in the Bible? Well, you're right. It's very expensive, and we'll talk about that in a minute. It's in the Song of Solomon in, um, in chapter 4, and the verse is beautiful. You are like a lovely orchard bearing precious fruit with the rarest of perfumes, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon. Mm-hmm. So all those fragrant um, ingredients and, and uh, rhizomes, yes, it's really a lovely, lovely passage. And when you said it's expensive, it's a real exotic spice. No, I don't know that anybody uses it mainstream, mm-hmm. but during Bible days, the interesting thing was they used it sort of like we do today in cakes and to color and, and flavor whole grains. And then I found this out, didn't know this, that the Buddhist priests dyed their robes with saffron, oh. making them a brilliant, brilliant yellow. That so, makes sense. Yeah, it's still, it's as I said, we use it still in rice and grains and soups, um, Bouillabaisse is a, a real famous recipe using bull, uh, saffron. Um, so the, today I'm going to be sharing in a minute a recipe for Spanish bean soup. Um, and it uses leftover ham, so it's a good thing for this time of year. Absolutely. <clears throat> I'm so glad you have a recipe for us to uh, use up the rest of that ham that's still sitting in the <laughs> fridge from Easter Sunday. Yeah. But why is it that saffron is so expensive? Well, here's the thing. It it's known as the most expensive spa- spice. It flowers in, oh, in about the middle of fall, and it has to be hand-picked, Annie, in the mm. morning, because as the day goes on, the whole flower wilts, and so do the stigmas or those little colored threads that we know as saffron oh, sure. um, wilt also. And here's the thing. It takes about four to, four to 5,000 flowers to make one ounce of dried saffron thread. What? So, Yes, wow. that is the reason, and it's hand-picked. Wow, wow, wow. So then I know that there are a lot of, um, shall we say, imitation saffron out there. Um, how can you tell whether your saffron is is truly saffron? Well, here, here's how to do that. First of all, a lot of times they'll just uh, you'll have colored corn silk. Um, just drop a few strands into cold water and watch how see fast the, the color releases. Mm. And if the water changes really quick um, and the strands lose their hue and it's sort of red rather than yellow, most likely artificial dyes were used. Mm. Um, but if the water color sort of slow and even after it's colored, say, 10 minutes, the uh, strands stay red, you've got the real deal. So um, that's another thing. <clears throat> That's another way to tell. But I have to say, a little, excuse me, goes a long way. Yeah, and I want to get to that in, in just a moment here, Rita. But I, I, am, I want to go back to this, this little test. So mm-hmm. you have, you, you put a, a strand or two um, in water and you, you see it release quickly. So you think, oh, I've got fake saffron. I mean, is that still usable or should you just throw it away? Well, it's usable, but then the flavor is going to be compromised. Um, mm. I have had that, and a lot of times, too, I bought saffron, it'll say 100% Spanish saffron, and then when I uh, test it in a little bit of water, some of the strands turn uh, white, and it's, it's a lovely color and a nice aroma, and it has sort of a bitter flavor. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes they mix it, but, yes, you can use it. But um, if you get the real deal, keep it in the freezer. It's expensive, and it's not a mainstream ingredient. But it's used a lot in Spanish bean dishes, Um, and Spanish saffron is known as one of the best. So if you happen to buy some, buy a small amount, keep it in the freezer, and then use it um, in something like the recipe for Spanish bean soup that we're sharing today. Nice. So what, what kind of flavor does it add to something like a Spanish bean soup? Well, when you said you maybe never used it, it's got, a, to me, a bitter sort of a grassy flavor. 
very distinctive. I mean, the aroma, I, once you smell saffron, it's sort of like a curry. You know you've got mm -hmm. it. Um, but so uh, that's why I say a little goes a long way. And in this recipe um, for uh, the Spanish bean soup, if you don't happen to have saffron, it will still be delicious because you're going to put some paprika in there as well. Oh, nice. Yeah, take us through the recipe here, Rita. Okay, just real quick, and I'll have the whole uh, recipe on my site. You, um, you're going to take some garbanzo beans. Now, you can do fresh or canned, um, whichever. And if you use the fresh, you're going to soak them overnight, and then uh, you're going to start cooking them in some chicken broth. So basically, um, you're going to cook the, the beans in some chicken broth or vegetable broth if you want. And if you've got a ham bone, throw that in. Mm -hmm. um, and while that's cooking, you're going to saute some onion and maybe a bit of garlic and some olive oil. And then you're just going to add the onion, some chopped leftover ham, potatoes, a little saffron, and paprika if you've got it all to that pot. You're just going to cook that until the potatoes are done. Um, you're going to add some chorizo, the Spanish sausage, Ooh. if you have it, um, also known as Mexican sausage. So you, it's just a wonderful nice. soup with beans and leftover ham. It's just delicious and a little bit different with the paprika and the saffron. So I hope everyone tries it. Awesome. And you can find the <laughs> recipe again at abouteating.com. Rita, thank you so much. I'll talk to you next week, Annie. Sounds good. Bye. All right, it's half past the hour now on the Sunrise Morning Show. It's time for news. The Biden administration says there are no plans to change its policy toward Israel after seven humanitarian aid workers were killed in a recent Israeli airstrike. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre told reporters, however, the president expects a swift and thorough investigation of the incident. The president, meanwhile, will be holding a call with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today. Brian Shook has more. The expected call between the two leaders comes days after seven World Central Kitchen aid workers were killed in an Israeli attack in Gaza. Biden said he was outraged by the incident and urged Israel to do more to protect civilians in Gaza as Israeli forces wage war on Hamas. Netanyahu said the strike on aid workers was unintentional and an investigation is underway. I'm Brian Shook. During his general audience yesterday, Pope Francis appealed again for peace in the Holy Land. He said, I renew my appeal for the exhausted and suffering civilian population to be allowed access to humanitarian aid and for the hostages to be released immediately. Let us avoid any irresponsible attempts to escalate the conflict in the region, he said, calling for tireless efforts to put an end to this and other wars that continue to bring death and suffering to so many parts of the world. He also appealed again for a ceasefire in Ukraine. In his catechesis, the Holy Father focused on the virtue of justice at his general audience, continuing his series on virtues and vices. The Holy Father pointed out it's not just an individual virtue, but a social one. He said justice is fundamental for peaceful coexistence and said, where justice is not respected, conflicts arise. Without justice, he said, the law of the prevalence of the strong over the weak is entrenched. Meanwhile, church officials in Syria are now decrying a recent Israeli drone strike in Damascus. From Vatican Radio, Linda Bordoni reports. Archbishop Samir Nassar condemned the Israeli strike on the Iranian embassy in Damascus as a deadly attack that risks worsening the situation for Syrians who face enormous and growing needs. The Maronite Archbishop of Aleppo described the situation in Syria as a forgotten reality, where people, he said, are constantly searching for a piece of bread fuel, all kinds of medicine, to solve even the smallest problem. The Israeli raid on the Iranian consulate building in Damascus on Monday killed 13 people. Israel accuses them of supplying weapons to Hezbollah militias in Lebanon. The attack and the Iranian leaders' vow to punish Israel for the raid have raised concern that the war in Gaza threatens to escalate major conflict across the region. Prior to Monday's raid in Damascus, Israel reported struck targets in the north of Syria 
where the apostolic vicar of Aleppo told Asia News some 35 people were killed in an attack. Bishop Hana Yalouf was at pains to thank Pope Francis for having reminded the international community of the ongoing conflict in Syria, a conflict that has protracted for over 13 years and is mostly forgotten, he said as emphasised by Pope Francis on Easter Sunday. Indeed, after all these years, Bishop Yalouf said, the world seems to have forgotten Syria, but there is still a war here. And to this are added the devastation caused by the earthquake in 2023. Let us pray with the Pope. The bishop concluded that the weapons be silenced and that there is no escalation that also overwhelms Lebanon and cascading leads to a regional and global war. I'm Linda Bordoni. Emergency crews are still trying to reach hundreds of people in need of rescue after the major earthquake that rocked eastern Taiwan. Taiwan's National Fire Agency says nearly 700 people are believed to be stranded in hard-hit areas. Wednesday's magnitude 7.4 quake was the worst in Taiwan in 25 years damaging more than 90 buildings and displacing hundreds of residents. More than 1,000 people were injured, and at least nine have been confirmed killed. And it appears the Federal Reserve will not be cutting interest rates anytime soon, that coming after higher-than-expected inflation readings for the beginning of the year. That's the news. It's 35 minutes past the hour. If you would like to write to Sacred Heart Radio, our address is Sacred Heart Radio, 100 East 8th Street, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45202. Our phone number is 513-731-7740. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Schneller Knockelman Plumbing, Heating, and Air, treating customers with integrity for over 90 years for heating, air conditioning, water heaters, plumbing, and more. Schneller Knockelman at skpha.com skpha.com Looking for some wholesome family fun this summer? Attend a Holy Family Fest at Catholic Family Land located 20 minutes outside of Steubenville, Ohio. Mass, rosary, confession, and family-friendly activities combine to create a fun family vacation that provides the perfect opportunity to escape from the world for a few days and reconnect with God together. Financial assistance is available for families in need. Register online at afc.org. It's 24 minutes before the hour on this Thursday in the octave of Easter, the Feast of St. Isidore of Seville, April the 4th. Your forecast is brought to you on Sacred Heart Catholic Radio by Schneller Knockelman Plumbing, Heating, and Air online at skpha.com. Going to see snow today. Right now, it's kind of cold with temperatures in the mid-30s as you're heading out the door. For Cincinnati, overcast with spotty light showers and a high of 44. Overcast with a slight chance for some showers tonight and an overnight low of 33. Cloudy and cool with isolated afternoon showers tomorrow and a high of 47. For the Miami Valley-Dayton area, rain and snow this morning, then rain this afternoon, and a high of 45. Cloudy with a few rain or snow showers tonight, and a low of 34. Cloudy with a slight chance of rain or snow tomorrow, and a high of 47 degrees. This is Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. It's 37 minutes past the hour. You're listening to the Sunrise Morning Show on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Thanks so much for joining us on this Thursday in the octave of Easter, the Feast of St. Isidore of Seville. Gary Machuda is back with us now on the Sunrise Morning Show. He's online at Hands On Apologetics, and we have been going through his book from Emmaus Road Publishing called The Gospel Truth. How We Can Know What Christ Taught. Gary, welcome back. Morning, Annie. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. And we are talking rather conveniently about how Easter is dated this morning. Just happened to be the next section that we get to uh, as we continue through your book here. Um, I mean, even today we see some differences, but this was um, a bit of a controversy in 
the early church. And um, actually, well, before we get to the controversy itself, can you explain why you even cover this in the book? I mean, how is this used as an argument against Christianity? Yeah, well, you know, so far in the appendix of my book, I look at supposed early church fathers who erred. And uh, so non-Catholics, they balk at the idea of sacred tradition, and there are a few pad examples they give. We talked about uh, Clement and, and the Phoenix and other mm-hmm. things. This controversy over Easter probably is the strongest of all the cases uh, where you would have a conflict in sacred tradition, which, of course, it, it is in the uh, conflict. Interesting. Okay, so now explain what this controversy was all about. Okay, it goes by the fancy name of the Quattro de Decimen hmm. uh, controversy, which comes from a uh, Latin word Quattro Decimo, which means 14. And it has to do with the calculation of when do we celebrate Easter. And in the East, in Eastern Church, uh, there was a tradition of following the Jewish reckoning of Passover. So Passover begins on the 14th day of Nicene, hence the name Quattro de Decimen. Hmm. Um, and so it was a custom that three days later on the 17th, that is the date in which you celebrate Easter. So it's based on Jewish reckoning. And this was held by uh, Polycarp of Smyrna, who was a disciple of St. John, and also the bishops in Asia Minor, basically mm-hmm. around modern-day Turkey. And But this was not a universal practice because the Church in the West always celebrated Easter on the first Sunday following the 14 Nicene. Hmm. So you had Christians in East and West celebrating Easter on different days. So in the Easter may not be a Easter Sunday, where in the West it's always an Easter Sunday. Okay, so basically there was the emphasis on the fact that it was a Sunday that he rose from the dead um, versus the the i guess the the relation to the passover um and and so you could have you could be celebrating easter on a a tuesday or a wednesday yeah yeah exactly and what's important here is that both of these traditions seem to come from the apostles Hmm. um around you know the end of the second christian century there there was a controversy where uh excuse me the beginning of the, the second christian century Polycarp traveled to Rome to Pope Ananistus, and uh, they had a meeting about this because they wanted all Christians to to be unified in what they were going to celebrate Easter. And it ended where, uh, you know, Polycarp said he got his tradition from John, and and Ananistus said he got it from Peter and Paul, and they decided just to leave things as they were since they both traditions come from the Apostles. Well, you fast forward to the end of the second Christian century, and the controversy comes up again regarding, you know, the celebration of Lent. You know, when do we end our fasting for Lent? Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, lots of small local churches met together and affirmed that it would be on Sunday, you know, the Sunday following the 14th Nicene. And this brought, again, a conflict with those Eastern churches that uh, did it on uh, three days after Nicene. So at this point, uh, the current pope, who is Pope St. Victor, who, by the way, is one of the few African popes that we've had, mm-hmm. uh, was going to excommunicate the bishops of the East in order to bring uniformity throughout the Church on this issue. Wow. And it was uh, St. Irenaeus of Leon who steps in and basically counseled the pope just to let things stay the way they were. Right, and that seems to be a a wise move on the the part of of Irenaeus and and Victor, right? Because we're not talking about a matter of doctrine here. Yeah, and that's really the most important point. You know, it it's not a matter of dogma. The matters of dogma concerning Easter is, of course, the bodily resurrection of Christ, or perhaps the Eucharist, right? But when you celebrate the Eucharist, or when you commemorate those dogmas right, uh, doesn't really matter. It is a matter of practice rather than a matter of teaching. So um, so there really isn't a, a conflict in apostolic teaching. Of course, that is exactly what 
sacred tradition is all about. It's not a matter of so much a practice as a matter of teaching. And so, you know, this controversy comes about as close as you can get to an actual conflict in sacred tradition. But like you said, the problem is it's not sacred tradition at all. It's just sacred custom, even an apostolic custom. Yeah, it is really interesting that it appears that there there's um – well, I don't want to say division. That doesn't seem to be the right word, but for, for lack of a better word coming to mind, uh, differences, I guess you could say, between even the way that the apostles did this. And so it's really just sort of an emphasis on which part of the story um, you're, is is more appealing to you, I guess. is that yeah. I, I, I'm not sure how to explain it. Yeah, exactly. So for those who follow the, uh, the Quadrum of Decimus, aspect of following the Jewish practice, um, the emphasis would be on the Passover and uh, the continuity with Judaism. And that's very important, right? Uh, That gives the significance to the Mass. And for those in the West and the rest of the world that followed the the custom of celebrating on Sunday, the emphasis was Sunday, which, as you know, Sunday is the first day of the week. And since God created everything in a week— uh, the resurrection on Sunday signifies a new creation. Mm. So uh, that in itself is uh, worthy of emphasis as well. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's really more of a, a difference of emphasis, although the belief that we should commemorate Christ's bodily resurrection is, you know, something that uh, approaches dogma. Right. And then we have now differences between the Julian and the Gregorian calendar, right? <laughs> Like, we have different kind of dating controversies in this day and age. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, some, especially uh, Orthodox churches still uh, follow the older Julian calendar. And so, yeah, the days are even more different now than uh, they were before. But the important thing is we all believe in the resurrected Christ. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And uh, you can read more about this super interesting part in his uh, appendix in Gary Machuda's The Gospel Truth, which you can find through Emmaus Road Publishing, EmmausRoad.org, or linked through SunriseMorningShow.com. Gary, really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. All right. It is a quarter till now on the Sunrise Morning Show, and Dr. Jeffrey Morrow joins us next. Support is from Solidarity HealthShare. Do you have an insurance plan that pays for everything, even things that violate your beliefs? Have you ever felt there has to be a better way, but didn't know you had any options? If you answered yes, I've got some good news for you. There is a better way and a more affordable way. Solidarity HealthShare can save you hundreds of dollars each month while actually supporting your beliefs. Because the best news is that Solidarity HealthShare costs a whole lot less than insurance. It's time to jump in and put your money where your faith is and put some money back into your wallet at the same time. Join Solidarity HealthShare, a faith-based healthcare sharing community. Prices start as low as $384 a month for families. Call to see how much you can save, 844-334-3245. That's 844-334-3245. Solidarity HealthShare, 844-334-3245. Four, five. It's the Easter season, and the Carmelite Monks of Wyoming have special coffee blends in honor of the resurrection, including Easter sunrise. And when you purchase some after clicking the Mystic Monk coffee link at sunrisemorningshow.com, we earn a commission. While you're at our site, be sure to check out our online store to get a Sunrise Morning Show mug or travel mug. Support the Sunrise Morning Show while celebrating the rising of the Son of God with Easter sunrise blend. Do so at sunrisemorningshow.com. That's S-O-N-RiseMorningShow.com. The most original and exclusive Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. I don't like looking back. I prefer to look forward and keep moving forward. There's plenty to cover. I do a lot of research and try to dig out the bits and pieces of a life or of an agenda that people don't want to talk about. The World Over with Raymond Arroyo. Tonight, 8 Eastern on EWTN Radio and Television. Getting ready for Divine Mercy Sunday. 
That's later on Take Two with Jerry and Debbie on most of these EWTN stations. Now back to the Sunrise Morning Show with Anna Mitchell and Matt Swain. It's time for our weekly Old Testament Bible study here on the Sunrise Morning Show. We've been using a Catholic guide to the Old Testament from Ascension Press. You can find it online at ascensionpress.com slash Old Testament. And we are back with one of the contributors, Dr. Jeffrey Morrow. Good morning, Dr. Morrow. Good morning. It's great to be here. It is great to have you. And today we are on to the book of the prophet Amos. Now, what do we know about Amos and where does he land in the Bible timeline? Sure. He's a little bit easier to deal with than the last one we dealt with, uh, Joel. So we know a little bit more about him. He raised sheep, right? He was a shepherd in Tekoa. Uh, He's perhaps the earliest of these minor prophets. He might be the actually the earliest one. So he's probably, probably, because we know it's during the reigns of Uzziah, and of Jeroboam II. So he's probably somewhere between 770 and 760 AD, uh, sorry, BC. So we're talking really, this is the 760s. So this is long before the Babylonian exile, and it's even before the Assyrian exile. So that's, that's what we know about him in his time period. Okay, so the guide tells me that other than Amos, and what by the guide I mean... Sure. The Catholic Guide to the Old Testament tells me that other than Amos, the other major character in this book is the priest Amaziah, sure. associated with idolatry, the idolatrous sanctuary of Bethel. Oh, that makes sense. So in the north, that makes sense because so so they are worship. So what's basically happened is the north has set up their own temple. Okay, so he must be a priest of the temple. The North has set up their own temples to worship, and they worship false gods. Initially, they're worshiping Yahweh there, but then they start worshiping false gods. So Amos is interesting because he's from the tribe of Judah, I believe. He is in the south. He's in the southern kingdom, but he's called to preach to the north. So we already had a prophet, Hosea, Mm -hmm. who preached to the north, but he's from the north. Amos is from the south, and he's preaching against the north, but he begins preaching against the nations who oppressed Israel. So if you're in the north, you're kind of like cheering him on, and then he turns <laughs> against those from Jeroboam the second. So this Amaziah must be a priest during Jeroboam the second's reign in the northern temples, and that's the problem. So he's preaching judgment against the north, and I think this is misused sometimes. Some of his language against the worship is, "Well, God doesn't want ritual worship." No, mm. he's criticizing kind of schismatic worship, if we will. He's criticizing the worshiping of God or the false gods, pagan, idolatrous worship, not on God's terms. So God has told them how to worship, and in the north, they're doing their own thing. Yeah. Well, that seems pretty consistent with what the the north, uh, just in general, uh, with all things, um, when you read about it in in the the Book of Kings. Um, Now— Let's talk about well. I guess basically, give it, give us the basic outline of sure. of the Book of Amos before we dive into anything else yet. Sure thing. There's like four major sections after the intro and the end. There's four major sections. You have the oracles against the nations, which I think they would be very happy with the uh, Israelites mm-hmm. uh, because he's going against everybody: Aram, the Philistines, <laughs> the Edomites, the Ammonites, Moabites, and then he goes into his rebuke of the north after the south. Um, then you have the second major section, chapters 3 to 5, where he's he's basically speaking to the Israelites, the house of Israel. Um, and then you have the woes, right, the woes on Israel is the third part, where he's, you know, those who are against justice, right, um, those who seek the day of the Lord, but it's not there, and they're going to be in trouble, those who um, are, you know, with Samaria and against Zion, okay, so that's kind of that's the third section. And then the fourth are the kind of visions of judgment, where you're going to have, the, you know, the, again, the swarm of locusts, kind of like what we saw with Joel. Um, you're going to have, uh, you know, all of this, you know, these basic issues, these visions he has of the judgment of Israel, of the north. And that's, that's basically the kind of overview of, of the structure. 
Well, Amos is cited, and we talked about Joel last time and how St. Peter cited the book of the prophet Joel during Pentecost. And as you move through the book of Acts, Amos mm. is cited during the Council of Jerusalem. Can you oh, wow. talk about what was going on at the Council of Jerusalem and, and perhaps some theories as to why Amos might be cited amidst that? Well, I just so this is one of the passages I was going to be actually. It's my one of my favorite sections of Amos is at the end. I didn't realize, I didn't remember that was in the Council of Jerusalem, and I'm looking there now at Acts 15 about the rebuilding of David's dwelling. So this is one of my favorite parts of um, of Amos because so Acts 15 the controversy is do do Gentiles need to be circumcised and become Jewish in order to follow Jesus? And the answer, of course, is is no. Baptism does what circumcision right was pointing towards. Right, it, baptism circumcises the heart mm-hmm. in a way that circumcision could not do. But that section of Amos that is quoting um, is, in that day will raise up the booth of David that has fallen. It's messianic. It's talking about um, the coming of the Messiah, the new king of David. And so it's emphasizing, I think, in Acts, the way that James is using this at the council is to support what Peter has said. And that is that, um, that, that the coming of Christ is the fulfillment of the old. So the old rituals, right, which Thomas Aquinas says are many, but they're, and they're difficult and they don't do a whole lot, are fulfilled in the new that are few but efficacious. And so actually, if you read beyond what's quoted at that end section of Amos, beyond what Acts quotes, you have this line, it's one of my favorite lines here, the mountains shall drip with sweet wine. Mm. And that's the end of verse 13. And I, I think the way that you see this in the tradition, the Christian tradition, is this is Eucharistic. This is about the coming of, of Jesus inaugurating the sacrament. And for Acts, of course, right, baptism fulfills circumcision. That's really beautiful. So as somebody is opening the book of the prophet Amos, Dr. Morrow, what would you yeah. encourage them to keep in mind or look out for yeah. themes that they should, they should be thinking about as they read through this prophet? I would say the first is you is you want to worship God on God's terms. We often want Jesus to do what we want. But really, you know, he has a plan that's much greater than what we have. And what he's asked us to do is worship him on his terms. But it ends with really the sign of hope. So all of his woes ends with hope that God will bring restoration and salvation. And it'll be in a much more super abundant way than we could ever have imagined. Again, in in his language, the mountains shall drip sweet wine, which we can understand Eucharistically. So no matter how bad things get, even when we go astray, as northern Israel did, right, there is hope. There's that hope of restoration turning back to God. We've been talking to Dr. Jeffrey Morrow, and you can find a Catholic guide to the Old Testament linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Much more to learn in there about the book of the prophet Amos. You can also go to ascensionpress.com slash Old Testament to get a copy and study yourself. Dr. Morrow, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, that will do it for this national edition of the Sunrise Morning Show on this feast of St. Isidore of Seville. Pray for us. We got another hour coming up for our local audience here in the Cincinnati Dayton area. And anyone who listens to the Sunrise Morning Show app, which if you have not downloaded it, you can do so by visiting our website, sonrisemorningshow.com, which is also where you can access the podcast to revisit any of our interviews you heard this morning. But until tomorrow at EWTN, may God bless you and keep you and grant you his peace. I'm Father Rob Jack. Join me this afternoon for Driving Home to Faith when Margie Christie will share the Sidewalk for Life campaign in Dayton. Dr. Jennifer Roback Morse will discuss the Ruth Institute's Adult Appreciation Week. I'll reflect on St. Mark's story of Jesus' resurrection, the frequent traffic and weather to get you home safely. That's this afternoon beginning at 4 on Sacred Heart Radio. You're on the road to Christ the King. Just a short 10-minute drive from downtown Cincinnati, Carmel Manor in Fort Thomas, Kentucky is pleased to offer quality Catholic health care with a modern campus overlooking the Ohio River and Carmelite sisters in residence to address your spiritual needs. Mass is offered six days per week just steps from your private room. 
three hot meals a day offer time for fellowship and reflection. 24-hour skilled nursing is available if needed. Catholic long-term care close to the city, Carmel Manor. The difference is love. For information, carmelmanor.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Hoting Realtors. The current real estate market is challenging, but the professionals at Hoting Realtors are equipped with the market knowledge and tools needed to make home buying and selling easier. 513-451-4800 and at Hoting.com. Why wait in endless lines at the pharmacy when Brozard Pharmacy, a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio, can fill your prescriptions in a timely manner with high quality. Brozard Pharmacy, fast, friendly service without the wait at brosartpharmacy.com. St. Michael's Rosaries and Religious Articles, a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio, can help you share your faith in style with high-quality socks and T-shirts featuring your favorite saints and the Blessed Mother. St. Michael's Rosaries in beautiful Miamisburg or online at stmichaelscustomrosaries.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Lefke Tree Experts. For residential or commercial tree pruning and removal, brush clearing, storm cleanup, and more, Lefke Tree Experts, 513-325-1783, 513-325-1783. For more than 150 years, the Comboni missionaries have served the poorest and most forgotten people. With our founder, St. Daniel Comboni, as an inspiration, we work for the full development of the human person through evangelization, education, and advocacy. Your donations make a huge impact, and 95% are used to fund our many projects. Find out more at ComboniMissionaries.org. That is ComboniMissionaries.org. Hi, I'm Anna Mitchell, MC for Heartbeats for Life 5K, sponsored by Cincinnati Right to Life, Saturday, April 20th at Lunkin Airport Playfield. It's a day of food, family, and fun to keep hearts beating in Ohio. Register at CincinnatiRightToLife.org. This is Bishop Roger Foyes of Covington. Thank you for listening to Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. 740 WNOP Newport, 910 WPFB Middletown, or get the app, stream, podcast, and more at SacredHeartRadio.com. Sacred Heart Radio. Arise, it's a new day. Hear his word, let us pray. The Sunrise Morning Show. 